So, it, however, I can tell you that this is a pattern-free talk. So this at least is... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so when you try to model the interaction between vegetation and, uh, and, uh, and climate, you have, of course, a lot of choices. The, the, the usual and standard choice and the, and the needed choice is to use global or regional climate models in which there is vegetation and so on and so on. These are very complex, though, and also not necessarily always providing clear answers. So there is a whole hierarchy of models, and then in particular we'll focus on the, on the lower level. I mean, the most simple, which is process models, uh, which have a long history. Of course, these are just metaphors. There is no way that these can really reproduce uh, observations or data, but they can try to provide some way to, to understand what's going on, maybe. Uh, so, in particular, looking at process models and feedbacks, you need to uh, focus on various feedbacks, uh, one at a time or maybe two at a time. And then the feedback we are interested, I was interested in here, is the vegetation precipitation. So, interaction between vegetation, soil, and the hydrological cycle. So, in particular, looking at the uh, interaction between three components, the soil, vegetation, and atmosphere with uh, uh, hyper-simplified models and taking into account local recycling. The fact that there is moisture coming from outside, moisture going away, usually at a higher level, and then, and then there, is, there may be local recycling. So the first question that, that we looked at was the summer heat waves at continental mid-latitudes. Uh, like the summer 2003 in, in Europe, I mean, it was very hot, very dry, a lot of damage and so on. And it's known that causes for these, uh, uh, for these uh, summer uh, heat waves is, is, is two causes. You need both. I mean, of course, anticyclonic conditions, so very low uh, input of moisture from the, from the ocean, and also dry soil moisture anomaly at the beginning of summer. Usually you need both. I mean, there is, the statistics is not much, but the little statistics that one has indicates that. There are many, many papers on this issue. So what, what our contribution was to try to, with a very simple model, in which we have basically uh, fi uh, five equations, which is moisture and temperature in the soil, uh, moisture and uh, uh, temperature, relative moisture in particular, and, and potential temperature in the planetary boundary layer. So this is the planetary boundary layer, let's say 1,000 meters. And then, uh, and then the biomass. And then, of course, you have all processes. You have radiation coming in. You have emission of uh, latent heat in the term, in, in sense of evapotranspiration, uh, sensible heat and radiation from the soil, and so on. I mean, we can... We could spend more time, and I would be happy of spending more time on that, I mean, because uh, most of the assumptions are sort of physically based, but of course all of the assumptions are questionable. In particular, what you have is moisture coming in here. This is the equation for atmospheric moisture. You have radiation, solar radiation coming in with the albedo effect, evapotranspiration and leakage. The biomass dynamics is the usual uh, Tillman-Levin's uh, description. For B, is not biomass, sorry, but it's vegetation cover. So it goes from zero to one. And then this term is important. I want to spend maybe half a minute more on that later on because this is the uh, convection. So it means that when the uh, equivalent potential temperature of the PBL is larger than the equivalent potential temperature of the upper troposphere, of the troposphere, uh, then you have convection. And then we simulate convection in the simplest way, which is convective adjustments. You have homogenization of the equivalent potential temperature. We'll see that in a moment. Evapotranspiration is uh, based on the models by Ignacio, La, Laio, uh, Amilcar, and, and uh, all, all that group, which basically you say you have these from uh, vegetated areas, and we put these from the non-vegetated. This is pure evaporation. This could be slow... It could be, depending upon S, it could be constant, but the important thing is this is much less than, 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 than transpiration. Is this model a good model? Well, it's a very simple model, but we try to, in a different world, to, to compare it with measurements in a mid-latitude test site in, 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 in Italy uh, on three years. And then what you see is that this is, has been simulating only the summer. This has been simulating continuously. Uh, this is soil moisture. It's... Not bad. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's doing something. And then it's what we use now uh, in, in, in this model. And this is not the, this is not, it's not the worst thing that we are doing in building this model. I mean, there are things that are worse than that. Albedo, 
albedo is just uh, coming from Charney. I mean, you have an albedo from the vegetated soil and albedo from the uh, bare soil. And then uh, vegetation dynamics, this is where most scenes sin come, right? I mean, vegetation dynamics is the levin steelman approach uh, for vegetation cover. Uh, and the colonization rate is assumed to be a function of soil moisture. So it's a zero up to the uh, value where stomata are fully open, and it's some value above, and mortality is larger below the wilting point, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, slightly smaller above the wilting point. Then you can play with this, of course, and get something similar, something different, depending upon what you do, but it's quite robust to the basic choices. This is convection paraphernalia. I was, want to say something on this because then we, we need to go back to that in two different steps. Uh, so when the, the, potential, the equivalent potential temperature of the PBL is larger than that of the troposphere, which is fixed in this model is given, then you have convection and you uh, basically uh, homogenize uh, moist enthalpy, you homogenize the, the uh, equivalent potential temperature, but you have to make a choice because you have one equation, you have two variables, which is the difference in the heat transferred and the moisture transferred. So you have to decide what you do, and then what do we do here is something that is, does not come from first principle, comes from observations that the, after convection, the relative humidity of the PBL remains constant. It's a certain value before convection, but well, observations show that it keeps the same value after convection. This is not, there's no theory for that. It's just an observation, but it's very, a very robust observation. And the other thing is that how much of the moisture, well, the moisture condenses, and then it precipitates. How much it precipitates? Well, we use this. This, again, comes from very few uh, experimental measurements. This is the efficiency of the formation of precipitation, which we assume to be a nonlinear function of the intensity of the flux, of the convective flux. The stronger is the convective flux, the stronger is the process that transforms moisture into precipitation. Uh, this is uh, the important piece of the story. There are very few observations for this. You cannot do it with models because most models assume this. So it's really one of the open issues. Results, when you have very low uh, uh, input of uh, moisture, you get a dry state. When you have very large input of moisture, you get a moist state, a wet state. When you are in between, and these are sort of realistic values around one millimeter per day, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe during summer, well, you get a bistability. You get bistability, and in fact, what you, go, you do, you get to, uh, to uh, in, in the parameter space of the initial value of soil moisture, initial vegetation cover, you get that if you start here, you get a wet summer, a cool summer. If you, get, if you start from here, you get a dry and a hot summer. So that's, that tells you that you need enough initial soil moisture and enough vegetation. Of course, the exact values depend on the, param on the model choices, but the, the, the overall picture is quite robust. So again, this is a, in a simple model, it tells you that yes, I mean, you need a dry uh, uh, anomaly of the soil in order to get uh, a summer, a summer uh, drought. And then if you allow the input of uh, moisture to, to vary uh, stochastically, basically you get a distribution of values, which is most summers are are uh, wet with uh, larger soil moisture, but you can get from time to time summers which are uh, much, much drier, but the vegetation cover does not change much in this, in this simple model. Okay. So given this, we can go to deep space and we could try to say, well, suppose now we, we want to study the importance of vegetation in the hydrological cycle, and let's do it, let's be extreme. Think of a planet like Arrakis, I mean, the planet Dune in the, in the series of novels from uh, Frank Herbert, which is covered with sand. Well, for those of you who know Dune, uh, we don't have worms, okay? We didn't put worms in the, in the model yet. But we do have the, uh, the, the sand, and there is water in the sand. Uh, so if there is no vegetation, you can have only evaporation. If you have vegetation, you have also transpiration, which is, can reach deeper water, and so there is. So the question is that what happens? Can vegetation sustain itself? And so you do a model which is slightly more complicated. You need it to do a little more complicated. So now this is the whole planet. There is no spatial dependence. So you have two soil layers in order to distinguish between evaporation and transpiration, so two temperatures and two uh, humidities. 
And now you want to resolve also the troposphere. So you have the PBL, you have the troposphere, and then uh, uh, you have temperatures and humidities and the, the amount of uh, uh, liquid water which you need in order to do the radiative calculations and the albedo. So you have also the liquid water there. So this is our planet. Uh, and then uh, we have all the radiative flux, I mean, solar radiation coming in, and then all the radiative uh, exchanges and so on. This, this usual thing. These, these, these parameters, happily enough, are I mean, sort of uh, for, for the Earth are known. For Dune, I don't know, but I mean, you can, we use the same. Uh, then you have, uh, this has been described before, I mean, you have uh, by Yost, for example, you have two layers. The only thing is there is no space, no, no, no lateral space here. And then you have the role of vegetation. And then uh, this is again the, the, the convection when the equivalent potential temperature of the PBL is larger than that of the troposphere, but now the one of the troposphere is a dynamical variable, and you have all the hydrological cycle. I would be happy of discussing the equations. I mean, I don't think it's time now to enter these. These are very simple in a sense. The basic choices are, uh, again, these, and again, the convection parameterization. The convection parameterization continues to be important, uh, and now we, ca we can make two choices. I will use here the constant relative humidity in the PBL, as before, but you could also use fix the Bowen ratio, I mean the ratio between the latent heat and the, and the sensible heat, and then to fix that value typical for the desert, for example. They provide similar results. Uh, and then again, you have this, this feedback. What happens? Well, this is what happens is that Depending upon uh, uh, the, the system has three states, for very low uh, soil, initial soil moisture in the, in the sand, uh, then you basically get a hot desert. In between, you get a cold desert. And uh, when uh, soil moisture is large enough and the, the vegetation cover is large enough, you get a, a system that sustains itself. So you can, you can terraform dune, provided that you put enough vegetation and there is enough water in the, in the, in the uh, soil. Uh, so, well, this is interesting for doing, but it's also interesting for understanding, we hope, uh, the hydrological cycle on continental areas where there is very little influx of moisture from the ocean. I mean, if you want, this is the kind of motivation that brought up. So take a, a continental area where there's not much moisture from coming from the oceans. So transpiration from vegetation is able to sustain the hydrological cycle. Uh, there are multiple steady states. And a few details which, however, could be of some interest is that transpiration feedback, as we always found, found the transpiration feedback to be more important than the, than the uh, albedo feedback, the Charney mechanism. Charney mechanism is there, but if you, if you turn it off, nothing really changes. But the transpiration me mechanism in this model, I mean, in this model world, is more important. Uh, the other thing is that where is the, the driver, where is the motor of all these? It is in the convection parameterization. I mean, everything, really, the feedback that is crucial is this feedback here. This is the nonlinearity which is uh, driving the whole system. All the rest is nice dresses it, but this is the real the, the point. And this is one of the points that are less explored. Um, I will come back to that. Uh, no, I, I go now. I go now to that, uh, and then I come back later. So because we talk about the precipitation feedback, now if we look at rainfall, however, this is something that we didn't discuss much during this, uh, the, during this workshop, the atmospheric branch. This is a simulation with WARF of, uh, of uh, precipitation, 400 by 400 kilometers. WARF is a fully, you know, one of these big models with everything in it, microphysics, everything. And what happens is that uh, precipitation, it's uh, very localized. This is very dynamical, but it, has, uh, it creates large-scale patches. So, of course, the, here the soil is homogeneous, so this moves around. But now suppose you start putting vegetation and then you start putting some soil that is not homogeneous and fluxes are not homogeneous anymore. So how important is, is this? I mean, how, how, and these are cases which are 
much larger than the scales of the patterns we have been discussing till now, though. I mean, okay, so that is something which is it's not unexplored, but it's not very much explored. Now, when you start going to deep space, uh, you, 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 it's difficult to stop. Then, uh, so one thing you can do to expand uh, this little model, which is quite important, is to try to go to 1D. So your planet is not a box anymore, but at least there is a latitudinal dependence. This is a very old story. Boudicca and Sellers, I mean, the 1D energy balance models, you can use them and try to make your own little climate and start to see what happens. And what we are doing now, well, you can do many things with the 1D energy balance models. You can explore specific processes, for example, vegetation, when you put also lateral uh, um, expansion of vegetation. You can do long and ancient paleoclimatic simulations. We, what we did and we are doing, it's even deeper space, is planetary habitability. You know that there are almost 1,000 planets, which are exoplanets, which have been discovered recently. Some, some by the Kepler satellite, more hopefully by the Gaia mission. And some of these planets are in what is called the habitable zone. The habitable zone is, called, is, is defined as the area where the surface temperature of the planet allows for liquid water, at least on a, por on a relevant portion of the planet. It's, a, it's one definition. I mean, it's not the best definition, but it's one possible definition. So uh, you can define the habitable zone based on geometrical considerations, luminosity of the star, characteristics of the orbit, and so on. But of course, we know that the, if you do that for Earth, you get a, a minus 18 degrees as the average temperature for the Earth. It goes to 15 because of climate, because of CO2, because of uh, the atmosphere. So you cannot do this without uh, looking at the climate of the exoplanet. So we started working on, on exoclimates. And then what you see, for example, if you look simply at, this is the distance from the star, it's insulation, right? This, the, the Earth is here. Well, if you look at what is the pressure of the atmosphere of this, uh, of this rocky planet, the habitability zone really uh, depends a lot on the pressure of the planet. So it moves in and out. And so in order to, to decide a priori where to look at, you should take into account the climate of the planet as well. Uh, f one caveat, this is a talk which says simple models are nice and you can do a lot of things and you can do a lot of, you can learn a lot of science. I mean, for example, when you, in a 1D energy balance model, you put clouds, you have no clue where to start with. Clouds is a nightmare. So you need to start reading again from the beginning. But watch out, usually, if you put a double well in, you get by stability out. So be sure that you don't put double well, uh, forcing double well inside somehow. Then you, otherwise, you don't be surprised to get by stability. Uh, the final thing, which is two minutes, all this was on models. Data, however, are essential. So this is just an ad. Maybe you know there is a, an international program since 2005 that's running, we run to that, the, till 2025 most probably, which is called GEO, it's the, global, uh, it's the Group on Earth Observations. It, uh, has, it was founded by, um, it's, I mean, it's, there are 90 governments and 67 international organizations involved. And the, the goal of these is to create what is called GEOs, the Global Earth Observation System of Systems, collecting all possible observations in an open access way. Uh, this was mainly satellite in the past. In the last two years, it's becoming more and more field data, field observations, because they are absolutely needed, not only to validate the satellite, but really to provide new information. So GEO is organized in nine tasks, societal benefit actions, they are called. It is a jargon, of course, in these things. And the one uh, of interest to us is ecosystems. The other one is biodiversity. Uh, in, I'm coordinating the, the ecosystems task in the last, from the last uh, few months, so I, I, I really would like to uh, uh, urge uh, people who, who, who like to, to contribute with data, with models, with uh, analysis methods uh, to, to, these, uh, to this task, and in particular one of the key ecosystems which is considered and which is still a little quiescent is arid and semi-arid uh, regions. So, this was just to say that this is, a, this is a voluntary program. It's open access. It's devoted a lot to, to developing countries. Uh, and, uh, and that's it. Thank you. Yes. 
That was a great fun talk. Um, my question is, how local is local? I mean, this seems to me to be one of the key things that you can explore with this model, and it seems like it's an important way of thinking about sort of how to scale this convective effect in a way that, that feeds back either directly or down gradient on something else. Um, it, it's really a, a big local in the sense that uh, these models have been thought for uh, large areas. I mean, the kind of parameterizations that we use are, 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 uh, are used in general in energy balance models are thought for very huge areas, continental size areas. So you cannot use these kind of models as they are for, let's say, over a single forest. For example, the, the, uh, the fact that after uh, a convection um, uh, event, you get the same relative humidity, that's true when you average over a larger area. That's not necessarily true over a single patch. So uh, this is uh, you starting from the idea of column models, but the kind of parameterization you use is really, is really on, a, on a larger area. Can you comment on the time scales of the different equations? Because you have the PBL scale, you have the vegetation scale. Sure. Uh, for the for the for the planet, no? Yes. For yes. example, for this or for the other? Uh, Anything. Both, I would say. Uh, let, let's start with this, which is simpler. I mean, the the, the time scales are very fast for the for the um, uh, for the atmosphere. So time scales, uh, I would say, is order of hours for, for this. In fact, this is a model that does an instantaneous process because the convective adjustment is instantaneous. Time scale for the other is, let's say, daily to weekly, while the fluctuations here could be of the order of days to weeks to seasons. And this is, of course, is much slower. So It, it almost, but I didn't show that. But when when you do uh, this, the, you play this game here. Vegetation can adjust. So what? How did we obtain this? This is not one summer. No, it's many many summers. And vegetation can adjust. Now suppose you fix vegetation. You you have a crop. No, not fix. Just uh, uh, dropping D D DBT. Just not, not fixing it, okay. but dropping then, DBDT. Basically, yes. You can do that. You, you can do it, and you don't get much difference because you see that vegetation is not changing much. There is a slow adjustment, though. I mean, if you have a trend, uh, if you, yeah, you can do it. It means not is not uh, that that uh, that crucial. The, the other thing, however, if you fix vegetation like a cropland, then you get completely different results. Yes, yes that okay. I wouldn't do. That's yeah. Yeah, I, I can comment a little bit. Last question, I've said. Well, last question. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's not a question. It's more of a comment to answer, uh, uh, you know, the issue of a local versus mesoscale or global scales. There are, in fact, some formal definitions of those uh, of those issues. Typically, the local scale is associated with micro scale processes, and it's typically the size of a few boundary layer uh, large eddies. So you are talking of scales of up to uh, five to ten kilometers. Above that, you classify that as mesoscale, and above, you know, thousands of kilometers, you are talking about global scales. And that is really well related to the type of models that, that you are presenting. Okay, so the, the boundary layer uh, height is a good uh, parameters to, to give you, roughly speaking, depending on the processes that you are looking at, also what you can consider the local scale. And typically, under convective, strong convective activities, you are really within the range of a few kilometers. That's your local scale. Yeah. Just the last comment, yes, absolutely. Uh, the kind of uh, hypotheses made are good for an ensemble of convective events. So that's why I'm, I'm talking about regional scale, not a single convective event. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are 25 minutes behind, so please be back at 10 to 12.